Welcome to Lesson 13a, Introduction to Boundary Layers. In this lesson, we define boundary layer and its approximation. We'll discuss the boundary layer coordinate system and the boundary layer equations, and I'll talk about the significance of pressure through a boundary layer. First, a definition. A boundary layer is a thin layer of flow in which viscous effects and vorticity are significant. Here are some examples of boundary layers. I'll usually abbreviate boundary layer as BL. We can have boundary layers in both internal and external flow. For internal flow, consider a well-rounded entrance for a pipe. Flow enters smoothly through the bell mouth, and if it's well designed, the velocity profile will be nearly uniform, except for the region close to the wall. In this case, the wall wraps around axisymmetrically. In this entrance region, the velocity profile changes downstream, and what's happening is there's a thin boundary layer along the wall. This layer near the wall is called a boundary layer, where the velocity changes rapidly. In the inner part of the pipe, the flow is nearly irrotational. We call it the irrotational core region. But inside the boundary layer, the flow is very viscous. The boundary layer grows downstream, as I've drawn, and eventually the boundary layer from all around the walls merges and eventually we get fully developed pipe flow. Notice that the speed in the irrotational core keeps increasing as the boundary layer thickness increases. This is because the boundary layer doesn't carry its share of the flow, and therefore the flow in the irrotational core must increase to conserve mass. We can also have boundary layers in external flows. In fact, this is even more common. I'll show two examples. First, I'll discuss a flat plate. Imagine a very thin flat plate in a free stream of uniform speed capital U. We'll let x be along the plate and y normal to the plate. In this case, a thin boundary layer also develops on both sides of the plate, and the boundary layer profile at some x location looks something like I've sketched. We'll call the thickness of the boundary layer delta, and it's a function of x. In fact, you can see that delta grows with x. It's somewhat arbitrary how you define delta, the standard definition of delta, the boundary layer thickness, is the y location where u equal 99% of capital U. My second example will be an airfoil or 2D wing at some small angle of attack. I sketch some streamlines. Again, a very thin boundary layer will form along the walls, both on the top and on the bottom, and at the trailing edge they merge into the wake region. Outside of the boundary layer is the irrotational outer flow. In a later lesson, I'll discuss the formal procedure for analyzing a boundary layer flow. Here I'll give a brief summary. As part of the procedure, we solve the Euler equation in this irrotational outer part of the flow, ignoring the boundary layer. Then we solve the boundary layer equations inside this boundary layer. This process is less mathematically intense than trying to solve the entire flow using the Navier-Stokes equation. With modern computers, we can solve this kind of flow using computational fluid dynamics, but we can still learn a lot using boundary layers, and the analysis does not require significant computer resources. I sketch here the velocity profile in the wake. Since this wake is also a thin layer, we can solve this portion of the flow with the boundary layer approximation. In other words, a boundary layer does not require a wall. We can have a free shear flow like a wake or a jet, and as long as it changes slowly in the y direction compared to the x direction, we still call it a boundary layer. Now I'll discuss the boundary layer coordinate system. We'll consider only 2D steady incompressible flow over a body, like the flat plate or the wing that we discussed. There will be a stagnation point near the nose of the body, and we let x be the distance along the wall from this stagnation point, and we let y be the distance normal to the wall at any x location. For example here, but y is always perpendicular to x, so as x changes direction, so does y, such that it's always perpendicular to x, which is in turn always parallel to the wall. x is zero at the stagnation point and increases along the arc length of the wall, and y is locally perpendicular, so the boundary layer coordinate system is a local coordinate system. When we analyze such flows, I like to imagine putting a magnifying glass to this region, and the magnified view looks more like a normal xy coordinate system along a flat wall. Since we magnify so much, we don't really see this curvature. 
The boundary layer coordinate system is thus a local orthogonal coordinate system. I'll now draw the velocity profile in this magnified view. This is our boundary layer. The outer flow has a speed u of x. And note that this outer flow speed will vary along x since the body is curved and has finite thickness. The velocity profile will look something like this where we must satisfy the no-slip boundary condition at the wall and the speed approaches u of x at the edge of the boundary layer. Again, delta is typically defined as the 99% boundary layer thickness. Capital U of x is the outer flow speed. Now I'll derive the boundary layer equations. We'll do it by doing an order of magnitude analysis of terms in the Navier-Stokes equation and the continuity equation. When we did this previously, we had one length scale, L. Now we need two length scales, L and delta. L is typically the length of the body as previously, but when we're analyzing the boundary layer, we must use delta as the appropriate length scale. And in our boundary layer approximation, delta will be much less than L. In other words, we assume the boundary layer is thin, thin or small compared to our other length scale, L. For our order of magnitude analysis, x is of order of magnitude L, but y is of order of magnitude delta. So in our Navier-Stokes equation and our continuity equation, del del x will be of order of magnitude 1 over L, but del del y terms will be of order of magnitude 1 over delta. Hopefully you can see that this is more appropriate in this very thin boundary layer, where the speed changes rapidly through the boundary layer. When we magnify this locally, del del y has really nothing to do with our big length scale L. I'll start with the continuity equation. Again, we're assuming steady, incompressible, two-dimensional flow. And I'll use tilde to mean order of magnitude. The order of magnitude of the first term is capital U over L. We don't know the order of magnitude of velocity component V, but del del y is order of magnitude 1 over delta. Since these two terms must balance, since they're the only two terms in the equation, these two terms must be the same order of magnitude. Therefore, our V component is order of magnitude u delta over L. This is the result of the continuity equation. Now let's look at x momentum. This is the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation for our 2D incompressible steady flow. Again, we do an order of magnitude analysis. The first term is u, u over L. The second term has order of magnitude v, which from continuity is u delta over L, and then capital U over delta, since this term is del del y. The deltas cancel, so these two terms are of the same order of magnitude. The pressure term has order of magnitude 1 over rho. We'll let changes in pressure be of order of magnitude rho u squared. So del p del x is order of magnitude rho u squared over L. The density cancels, and this term agrees with the other two in order of magnitude. This first viscous term has order of magnitude nu u over L squared, and the second viscous term is nu u over delta squared, since this is a second order y derivative. Comparing these two terms, since delta is very small compared to L, and L squared is in the denominator here, compared to delta squared in the denominator here, this fourth term is negligible compared to the last term. So we'll cross this term off right away. What about this last term in comparison with the other three terms? To compare, let's multiply all terms by L over u squared, this will make these three terms of order magnitude 1, since L over u squared cancels out these terms. I'll first rewrite the equation where I've left out that fourth term, and after multiplying by L over u squared, the first three terms are all order of magnitude 1, and the last term from here is nu u squared over delta squared times our L over u squared, which we can rearrange to nu over u L times L over delta quantity squared. Let's define Re sub L as u L over nu, where kinematic viscosity nu is mu over rho. So our order of magnitude is 1 over Re sub L times L over delta squared. Now we argue that this term must be the same order of magnitude as the others, or else we would be throwing out the viscous terms. Then we'd be back to the Euler equation without any boundary layer at all. So let's force this order of magnitude to be 1, which is the same as the other three terms. We rewrite this as 1 over REL is order of magnitude delta over L squared, 
with the result that delta over L must be 1 over the square root of RE sub L. Noting that a boundary layer is thin when delta over L is small, the boundary layer approximation is valid for high Reynolds number flows. You can see that when Reynolds number is big, delta over L is small. Since we've retained all four of these terms, and they're all the same order of magnitude, the x component of our boundary layer equation is those four terms. Scrolling up to our original Navier-Stokes equation, we've lost one term, which makes the analysis easier. Now consider the y-momentum equation without going through all the details. After order of magnitude analysis, enforcing this one to be of order magnitude 1. The second term also turns out to be order of magnitude 1. The pressure term, L squared over delta squared, this term again is very small compared to the last term. And the order of magnitude of the last term is 1 over REL, L over delta squared, which is the same as we had in the x-momentum equation. So it's also of order of magnitude 1. Well, now we have a problem this term is huge compared to 1, so there's nothing in the equation to balance this pressure term. The only way out of this dilemma is that we must conclude that del p del y is approximately 0 in a boundary layer. This is the only way we can balance the equation since no other term is able to balance this large term. So this is our final boundary layer equation from the y-momentum equation. Here's a summary of our equations continuity, x-momentum, and y-momentum. I write here an alternate form of the x-momentum equation for a boundary layer. This can be easily shown by differentiating the Bernoulli equation. I also show that since del p del y is 0 through the boundary layer, p is not a function of y. It's not a function of time or z since this flow is steady and two-dimensional, so p has to be a function of x only. This turns out to be a significant finding in the boundary layer approximation and I'll discuss this in detail next. Our y-momentum equation reduced to del p del y equals 0. This means that p does not vary across the boundary layer. So for a boundary layer like this, along a wall, say at location 1, the pressure at some location in the boundary layer is p1. The pressure at some other location in the boundary layer is also p1. In fact, anywhere through this boundary layer, pressure is not varying in the y direction. This carries out into the outer part of the flow. It does vary in the x direction, so the pressure at these locations, even outside that boundary layer, is P2. P2 may differ from P1, since we've moved in the x direction. But through either of these boundary layers, the pressure is approximately constant. As we said, another way of saying this is that P equal P of x only. This has been incredibly useful since the early 1900s, for experiments, if we're conducting an experiment along a wall, we often insert a static pressure tap, which is basically just a hole in the wall with a tube that goes to a pressure measurement instrument. And we typically have several of these static pressure taps along the wall. Because of this result of the y-momentum equation, we know that pressure is roughly constant normal to the wall. So we measure P1 at the wall, but this is also P1 outside the boundary layer where the speed is u1. This has been used for decades to validate Euler equation solutions which ignore the boundary layer. And since pressure doesn't vary through this boundary layer, these measurements do a great job of estimating p outside the boundary layer. I'll do a quick example using our 2D wing. Again, the boundary layer coordinate system has x originating at the stagnation point and following the arc length of the body and at some x location, we can predict p of x and u of x using an irrotational flow approximation, namely the Euler equation or the Laplace equations for stream function or velocity potential function in the irrotational outer flow. And as long as this boundary layer is very thin, and this result from the y-momentum equation, this prediction is actually quite good. This technique of irrotational outer flow outside the boundary layer has been used for the design of airplane wings for decades until recently with the advent of the computer age. We can predict the lift using only the irrotational flow equations and get a very good result that matches experiment, provided that the angle of attack is not too large so that the flow separates or causes the wing to stall. We can even then go back 
and analyze the boundary layer to predict some skin friction drag along the wall, where we take into account both boundary layers on the top and bottom of the airfoil. Good grief. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.